and welcome back to Walking Through the Word. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me as we walk through the Word together. Last time we saw Paul talking about those um, who come to Jesus Christ through faith. Those are the ones who fulfill the law because it is only by faith. It has always been uh, by faith. Um, and as we're going to see here in Romans chapter 4, we're going to see that Paul recognizes that even Abraham um, was justified in the sight of God through faith and not by works. So let's dive into the scriptures. Starting in verse 1 of Romans chapter 4, it says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? So in this context... Paul is saying, what was gained, right? Because he just got finished saying uh, that people receive the righteousness of God or that the righteousness of God was revealed through faith in Jesus Christ. It was not by the works of the law. It was by faith and faith alone in Christ alone, um, by the grace of God alone for the glory of God alone. So then what, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? Of course, he's pointing back to the works of Abraham and that work was sorry about my pen Let's see if I can write this better what was gained by Abraham of course we're looking at circumcision if I can spell it right <laughs> Uh, sorry if I didn't spell that right, but what was gained? Of course, this word gained, he's pointing back to the work of Abraham in circumcision. He says, what was gained by Abraham, our our forefather? Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to specifically the Jews when he says our, but not the Jews only. But you'll see in a little while, he's also talking about the Gentiles. Paul's also um, including the Gentile um, when he says our father, because he's speaking to both Jews and Gentiles in this context. So he's saying, what shall we, was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? And of course, we can see that in this context, according to the flesh, he's talking about Jews and circumcision because the Jews were of the circumcision. He says in verse two, for if Abraham was justified again receiving the righteousness of, of Christ declared uh, innocent by God if Abraham was justified by works he has something to boast about but not before God so Paul's making a point here he's saying look um, we who have come to Jesus Christ have received the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, not by the works of the law, not even the work of circumcision, which was uh, the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to see in a little bit that the circumcision was actually a sign. It was a seal of what was already taking place in Abraham's heart through faith. And so Paul is pointing to the Jew who assumes that his work or that his circumcision means something. He's pointing to that reality. He's saying, um, if Abraham was justified by works, then he would have something to boast about. He would have something to say, look, God, I did this. I did this work. And because of this, I am justified. And he's saying, but not before God, never before God. We can never bring anything before God that we can say, look at what I have. Look at what I've done. Look at all the good works that I have accomplished. Um, we cannot do that. There is no righteousness in us. We are not good. Before the eyes of God, we fall short of his glory. So in verse 3, he says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed. And of course, this is going to point back to justification. Because he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness so you see it is faith alone it's 
only by faith. And we know that faith is the gift of God by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And that is the gift of God. It is the grace of God when one comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was not by uh, keeping the sign of circumcision. It was not by performing the act of circumcision. It was by belief or faith in God alone. And it was counted to him. This word counted to him is an important word. Um, just think of of um, of a bank account or think of a transaction something that's counted toward something else it was not his own it was given to him and now he has received it as a gift of god much like if uh, your bank account is at negative infinity and somebody uh, removes the debt completely and gives you an infinite amount of riches that's the idea that's taking place here. We're infinitely short of the glory of God. And because of our faith in Jesus Christ, Christ himself creates that bridge between the edges of the infinite chasm that separates us from God. And the same thing happened with Abraham when he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 4, now to the one who works. So he's talking specifically in this context to the Jew, of course, the one who's keeping the law. Or anyone, for that matter, who thinks that their works mean something. Or that their works should account for something. He says, now to the one who works, his wages, his wages are not counted as a gift. And of course, this points back to Romans chapter 3, uh, when he's talking about uh, receiving the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ by grace as a gift. Um, now he's pointing back to that and says, look, if you work, you rightfully earn your wages. You deserve your wages because you worked for him. Um, the wages that he receives uh, for his work are not a gift. They are his due. It's what he is owed. But in verse 5 he says, and to the one who does not work but believes and again this ties back to the gift but believes in him who justifies the ungodly that's us we are the ungodly we are the depraved the separated romans chapter 3 verse 10 through 12 no one does righteousness no not one no one seeks to understand all have become worthless we are the ungodly. So we cannot work for our justification. Just like the one who works and receives his wages as a due, that's not a gift of God. That is a mandatory payment. We cannot compel God to give us his grace. There is no amount of works there's nothing that we can do within ourselves that demands God to give us salvation or his righteousness. Except belief in him who justifies the ungodly. Because that belief, that gift, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as it was counted to Abraham. That's what he's making the connection here. Just as Abraham believed God's promises and that kind of belief that he um, that he exercised uh, that accounted to him as righteousness before God. In verse 6 it says, Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness, accounting, same idea, righteousness, apart from works so it's not by works it's by faith alone and he's pointing to david's words um, in the psalm where he says in verse 7 blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered and our sins are indeed covered they are removed by the blood of jesus christ remember this is 
This is atonement. Or as previous verses have said it, propitiation. Our sins are cov covered. Our lawless deeds are forgiven. Verse 8, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will count will not count his sin and indeed when we come to Christ by faith alone the Lord does not count our sin rather we are accounted righteous we receive the righteousness of God verse 9 is this blessing then only for the circumcised again the reason I titled this message um, the true descendants of Israel, Jews and Gentiles, is because Paul is going to make a very, very important point here. And that is that Israel, or the people of God, or those who are of Abraham, which is Israel, is not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. So he says, is this blessing then only for the circumcised, that is the Jew, or also for the uncircumcised, that's the Gentile? And it's a rhetorical question. The, un the obvious answer is, of course, it's for both. This blessing is for the Jew and the Gentile. It's for the circumcised and the uncircumcised. But Paul's making a theological point here through Abraham. He says, for what we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Right? So he's making a point. If Abraham was not ju justified by works, well, then how was he accounted as righteous? How, how was that possible? He explains, was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. I love it when Paul just gives us the answer blatantly. I don't have to explain it any further than that. Those who are accounted as righteous before God through faith in Jesus are not um, receiving the righteousness of God through works. It is only by faith. That's what Paul's point is here. Um, that's what Paul's point is throughout uh, the majority of the book of Romans is that Israel, um, though they had the law, Though they had the prophets, though they had the works and the circumcision, they did not pursue it by faith. They thought that they could receive the righteousness of God through works. And therefore, they were condemned before God. Abra he received the, the sign, that's Abraham received the sign. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal as a seal so circumcision in this case is uh, synonymous with the holy spirit because as we know in ephesians chapter one that when we believed the gospel when we believed the message that the Holy Spirit sealed us until we obtain the full inheritance of the kingdom of God at the end of the ages. I mean, so circumcision is a sign to Abraham as a seal of what had already taken place in his heart. Just as we, the Gentiles, who do not have the physical sign but the spiritual sign that is the holy spirit the, the spiritual seal when we come to faith in jesus christ we receive the sign and the seal of the holy spirit so he says in verse 11 he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised that's the point he's trying to get at, and that's the point he's trying to illuminate to uh, the Jewish audience that would listen to this uh, letter. Um, there were a lot of Jews during that time who believed 
that in order to receive the righteousness of God, you still had to maintain the works of the law and of the Old Testament and of the pro prophets. And Paul here is saying, no, Abraham did not do any works. He simply believed. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. He was justified before the sight of God. And this happened before he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of circumcision. But once he had come to faith in, G in, in God and believed in God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, then God gave to Abraham the sign of circumcision as a seal. He says this, because this is the, the most important conclusion that he makes here. The purpose, the meaning, the intention behind Abraham being accounted as righteousness um, through faith before circumcision, the purpose of God doing that was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That's such an important a statement by Paul. Abraham becomes the father of all who believed without being circumcised. So who is the true Israel? Is it ethnic Israel? Is it national Israel? Who is the true descendant of Abraham? No. It is those who believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well and you see the difference between the them and um, the Jew he's making a distinction between those who would think that their circumcision meant something as opposed to the Gentile the Jew would say I have circumcision the Gentile says well what do I have and the answer is faith alone just like Abraham. So the Jew is not counted as righteous before God for his works in the law. And that's true about all the Old Testament. No one in the Old Testament was justified by the works of the law. No one in the Old Testament was justified by their actions. So it is by faith alone. And Abraham becomes the father of of all those who come to Christ by faith because he came to God by faith which makes him the father of all who believe without being circumcised verse 12 and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised so you see he is the father of the circumcised but not of the physical circumcision it is about those who are circumcised of the heart and who have received the holy spirit as it says in ephesians 1 receiving the seal of the holy spirit and what is the evidence of that the evidence is those who walk in the footsteps of the faith. Just like when Abraham believed it was accounted to him as righteousness, then God commanded that he and his whole household be circumcised. And so he obeyed the commandment of God by faith. So we, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the righteousness of God and act out our faith by walking in the footsteps of the faith. How gracious God is that he would include us in this miraculous and wonderful work of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring. So, of course, Abraham and his offspring. And remember, like I said back in the earliest part, our forefather, of course, he's talking about the Jew here, our forefather, but he's also talking about the Gentile. And this is the point I was trying to get at. Um, he says here, 
For the promise to Abraham and his offspring, his offspring is not just Jewish people, but it's also Gentile people. His offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law. See that? The Jews were never... Um, it was never about being born into a specific genealogy or bloodline. It was never even being born into the right religion. You cannot inherit. You cannot inherit the grace of God. You cannot inherit the righteousness of God. It cannot be received through works. Because the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And who are those who adhere to that reality? Jews and Gentiles. You could also say the church, because the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles who come to God by faith. Verse 14, for if... If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, and of course, that's talking about the kingdom of God, the ones who are to receive the righteousness of God, salvation, um, the eternal reign of Christ. If it was about the adherents of the law, then faith is null. You see that here? Then faith is meaningless. It becomes nothing. And the promise is void. Paul's making a real strong point here. He's saying, look, if, if it was about doing the works of the law, then even Abraham would not have received the heir of the kingdom of God. He would not have received the righteousness of God by his faith because faith becomes void. It becomes nothing. And the promise becomes nothing. Verse 15, for the law brings wrath. Just as we saw in Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, we know that the law brings the knowledge of sin, and sin demands the wrath of God. So the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, and he's not saying that those who are Gentiles don't have the law, therefore there is no transgression. What he's saying is, where there is no law, where faith is the law, where faith is the requirement. Because where there is faith, then there is no requirement to uphold the law. So where there is no law, there is no transgression. The law brings wrath. When we try to bring our works before God, the only thing that you are accounted with your works is the wrath of God. But when we come before God in faith, then there is no law that is accounted to us as wrath, but rather the law of faith is accounted to us as righteousness before God. Because that's what God demands, faith in Him. Verse 16, that's why it depends on faith I love the consistency of Paul and just his deep theological thought in all of this it's so uh, profoundly wonderful to see um, just what God is doing in these verses so he's saying that's why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace undeserved unmerited favor that is the grace of God undeserved and unmerited favor and be guaranteed to all his offspring not just the Jews but also the Gentiles those who come to God by faith that's that's the that's the the center of it all faith in Christ if you come to Christ by faith alone, then you are the offspring of Abraham. Not just bloodline. It's never been about bloodline. It's always been about faith. 
not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. So he's making, um, he's differentiating those of genealogical descent and the ones who are of the true spiritual descent of Abraham. So he says, all his offsprings, whether the ones who try to adhere to the law, if they come by faith, then they are the offspring of, of Abraham. But if they are not adherents of the law, if they are not genealogical descendants of Abraham, then even the one who shares the faith of Abraham is the offspring of Abraham. Because he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. That's not talking about the genealogical nations that's come out of Abraham. That's not what's, that's not the point. The point is Abraham came to God by faith. And so because he came to God by faith, he is the father of all those who come to God by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, in, in all the nations, Jew and Gentile nations, all of those nations are descendants of Abraham. All of those within those nations, the people who have professed faith and belief in Jesus Christ alone, they are the descendants of Abraham. And that's why it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. That was us. We were dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2 says. And he calls into existence the things that do not exist. It's the image of the spiritually dead person who's brought into spiritual life. The imagery is Lazarus in the grave. He is dead. But God calls and he brings into existence the things that do not exist. Namely, life, spiritual life in us. We are dead. There is no spiritual life in us. It does not exist in us. John chapter 1 makes it very clear. We are children of the darkness. We love the darkness and we hate the light. And because we love the darkness we are dead in our sins there is no life in us it does not exist there is no light in us it does not exist but god gives life to the dead and calls that life into existence by his sovereign grace hallelujah and thank you god thank you father verse 18 in hope he believed against hope so abraham believed against hope against any human logic of hope so in hope in his faith in his belief he abraham abraham believed against it he hoped when it seemed like there was no hope he believed when it didn't make sense to believe he had faith when his physical eyes could not see the reason to have faith why that he should become the father of many nations god promised abraham that he would be the father of many nations and that from out of him uh, many nations would be blessed by him that was the abrahamic covenant pointing to jesus christ and he did not know he could not see there was no reason to hope and yet he believed in hope when there was no hope as he had been told so shall your offspring be verse 19 he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. And this imagery here, as good as dead, points back 
to this imagery. God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Well, in the same way, Abraham, his own body, he was a hundred years old when he had Isaac, the child of the promise. His own body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, who was just as old as he was. There was no reason to believe. There was no reason for him to have faith. His, he was a hundred years old. And his wife was nearly as old as him. She was barren. She had gone through um, the physical um, process of barrenness that every woman goes through who goes through menopause or goes through some kind of um, some kind of physical ceasing of having children that happens to every woman and Abraham said look at me I'm a I'm hundred years old and my body is pretty much as good as dead I'm an old man and my wife has gone through barrenness already she cannot have children there seem to be no hope and yet when God promises out of you shall come many nations he believed God in hope he believed against hope let us be like Abraham let us act according to that kind of faith verse 20 no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. So pay attention. Abraham could have easily said, this doesn't make sense. I don't believe you, God. But even when it seemed like there was no hope, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But rather he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. If you are in a position right now where you're saying, how do I grow in my faith? How do I grow stronger in my faith with God? In your weakness, give glory to God and your faith will increase. That's what Abraham did. He looked at the physical reality of his body and of his wife's body and he thought to himself there's no way but yet i still hope in god i believe the promises of god and no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of god but rather he grew stronger in his faith as he gave glory to god and that word in the middle as he gave glory to god is so important he didn't give glory to God because he grew stronger in faith. No, he grew stronger in faith because he gave glory to God. That's what Abraham did. And if we are children of Abraham, let us have the faith that Abraham had. Verse 21, fully convince that God was able to do what he had promised. That's the righteousness of God. God's ability to keep his promises. God's ability to promise something and keep it perfectly. God's righteousness. Verse 22, that is why, faith, why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And to finish off, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone so the reason that the scriptures tell us that his faith was accounted as righteousness was not so Abraham could read it and say oh look how awesome God is verse 24 it's for ours also so that when we read it we Gentiles when we read it and we say look at Abraham his faith was accounted to righteousness so we too, when we come to God by faith, it is accounted as righteousness.
So he says, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. It will be counted to us just as God promised to Abraham that many nations would be blessed by him so we who share in the same faith that Abraham had it will be counted to righteousness as well to us just as it was to him because it is by faith so it will be counted to us that is the promise of God and God's righteousness endures to the end because he's faithful in completing his promises it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification how glorious the gospel is that even we Gentiles who were born outside of ethnic Israel have now come become part of the family of Abraham because we have come to Christ by faith such a wonderful gift and that's why the true descendants of Israel are not just those who are physically descendants of Israel it's not just those who practice the law it's not those who are circumcised it is those who come to Jesus by faith because Abraham had faith and it was accounted to righteousness and so if you have faith it will be counted to you as righteousness as well and you can partake of the infinite riches of God through Jesus Christ to all of Abraham's descendants the promise that was given to Abraham is extended to you receive it by faith and if you do know that it has been given to you by God as a gift you did not deserve it you could not earn it it was a gift of God thank you so much for joining me on walking through the word until next time God bless you guys